Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and I want to welcome you today to this episode of The Living Word. We know that according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, that the Word is active, that we have been saved by the living Word of God. Jesus is the Word, and He lives still today, and through Him we are saved, and we have, we are privileged to have the Word of God. So today, I'm bringing you a teaching from the Word of God. This is part of a series of teachings called Attacks on Our Emotions. This today, we are talking about hidden demons. Through thousands of prayer sessions with hundreds of people, a pattern emerged. Often people find relief from attacks and many even receive healings, but the attack comes back and it just appears every now and then. This can be a physical healing that relapses or an attack on our minds our, and our emotions. It can also be an addictive habit. When it seems like we have dealt with a demon and, and then it kind of slides out of you only to put on a new mask, having a slightly different approach, but again, it begins interfering in our life. This is what we refer to as a hidden demon. Sometimes we don't even know that it is an enemy spirit at work in our lives. Through prayer sessions, we have found that there are many ways a demon can hide to maintain its place in your life, in every Christian's life. And often it is through internal or emotional sins. According to Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, this is the amplified classic version. The Bible says, when angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exa exasperation, your fury or indignation last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room, no such foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. The words here in parentheses, those are an, the full definition of this word that doesn't exactly translate into the English language. That's the reason why I like to use the Amplified Classic version on occasion. And we see here that it's not just what, what we think of as anger. It's exasperation, indignation, fury, resentment. When we give these a place and we hold and they're in our life for more than a day, it is a, an area that may allow the enemy to come in. You see, these emotions, they breed unforgiveness, leading into bitterness. As long as anger, resentment, fury exists, there's a place for the enemy to manipulate in your life. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, it says this, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop, let it go in order that your father who is in heaven may also forgive you of your failings, your shortcomings and let them drop. You see, this is dangerous ground. Would we let negative emotions remain until the next day, a root of unforgiveness may begin to develop. And when we don't forgive others, then our sins are not forgiven by our Father. It's the forgiveness of sins that allows the, the Father to remove the place the enemy has in our lives while we're on this earth. This is why the enemy can get a place through these negative emotions. Now, it may be, seem impossible that to not let anger have a place or unforgiveness have a place in your life. Without God, it is impossible. However, with our Lord, all things are possible. But it may be necessary to remove some hidden demonic influences first. The revelation of these hidden demons came in a prayer session. 
I was following the leading of the Holy Spirit. He had revealed that there were these hidden demons. There was something hidden. So I demanded, not merely ask it, asked, but demanded that any spirit, even a hidden ones that are not active, that don't have a right to move, that have a, but any demon that has a right to move in this person's place, in this person's life, I demanded that they step forward right at this moment and state their claims. When I stated, when I stated this, when I declared this and demanded it of the demons, I saw a demon that was fully formed and then it became a puddle. And a few seconds later, the demon would pop up in a completely different location. You see, this is what a hidden demon does. It only exerts influence for a time, a moment. Then it withdraws deep inside like a puddle. It's flat, it's still, so it can remain out of sight. One of the intercessors um, present at this meeting, they received sins, which the Holy Spirit made clear were the root access of this demon. Once they were confessed and the blood of Jesus applied, the demon was removed. At that same meeting, there was someone else there that we began praying for. Let's call her Judy. After demanding all spirits, even hidden one step forward, we listened. What we received was a perfect example of how a spirit can remain hidden and why. Judy heard, now excuse my French, Judy heard, oh crap. Well, right away, we knew that this was not from the Holy Spirit because he will not use impolite language. Hmm, our father is gentle. So when, when we hear language that is hmm, a little uh, hmm, not, uh, like I said, a little impolite, not necessarily even curse words, although curse words are a definite big flag that you're not hearing from the Holy Spirit or God, we know that it's not our God. We, we must be sensitive, sensitive to these things. So let me share where that is in scripture because it's so very important. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace to the hearer. That's Ephesians 4.29. In Ephesians 5, 4, it says, let there be no filthiness, no obscenity, no indecency, nor foolish or sinful or silly or corrupt talk or coarse jesting, which is not fitting or becoming, but instead voice thankfulness to God. You see, the Holy Spirit will abide by the word of God. And so he will not use coarse language, even if it's not a curse word. I mean, the word I used in most places are not considered a curse word but it is kind of coarse. It's kind of not nice, right? Not a nice word to use. And the Holy Spirit would never use that kind of language. So when Judy heard this, she knew it was not the Holy Spirit, but a different spirit attached to her. That spirit had begun to panic because it had witnessed what happened with the other spirit right there in the same Zoom room, right? So one of our intercessors saw a pair of eyes on her back and it was running to and from things. So this labeled the demon as a watcher. Its job was to distract her from her destiny. Judy began to explain that the Holy Spirit was bringing her memories. She had an old boyfriend who used to stalk her and watch her every move. When she was really young, there was a demon who used to talk to her, but a friend's mother who was a spiritualist did a cleansing and that de demon sang a goodbye song to her. Well, when you put these things together, the Holy Spirit helped us put them together. Here is what this means. We know as Christians, the only power we have over demons comes through the name and the blood of Jesus. All the spiritualist accomplished was to push that demon into hiding because now it knew it had been recognized. So it brought, the demon gave her temporary relief. But through the years, and especially in later years, it manifested by attacking her through that boyfriend who was watching and stalking her. So Judy repented for placing faith in something um, 
that wasn't God, placing faith in that spiritualist and what it had done. For any time that she had listened to this watcher spirit, then she confessed this sin and covered it, covered it with the blood of Jesus. Now that spirit could be removed. This is how easy it is to deal with hidden spirits. But first, you must be aware that there is something affecting you. Now, how does a person get a hidden demon? How do you, how do you, what are some things you can look at in your life to think, hmm, maybe there's an issue that needs to be taken care of? Well, let's look at the main ways that a hidden demon comes into a life. And so you can examine your own life for it. Okay. And, and what those attributes of the hidden demons are. So there are three main reasons that the Lord has brought to us. This may not be all the reasons, but here are three. One, listening to a demon. Two, abuse of authority. And three, repeated sin. By looking at these things, we can get a better idea of when a spirit is at work and how to remove it and what is necessary to remove it. Why, why did it possibly come in? So let's look at that very first one, abusing authority. We're going to go straight to the scripture for this one. Because it, this could be kind of interesting to look at. This might take a bit of explaining, but don't worry, we'll get there. Matthew 28, 18 to 19, American King James Version. That's AKJV whenever you see it. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. For years, I personally believe that all authority was given to me because so many preachers of stature were saying it was so. But recently, God has shown that That assumption is not supported by the word of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we have been given all authority. Only as it states here in Matthew that Jesus was given all authority after he rose from the grave. If you believe that you, that there is no transgression of authority, then I urge you to go and look at the class Traps When Praying. Check in the word of God to see where you get this all authority from. See if there's any scripture that that says we have been given all authority. As I began the journey to understand the rightful authority my Lord has given me, I asked myself some important questions. If an earthly king has authority, do all those under him have that very same authority at all times? How about his heir? Does the son of an earthly king wield all the power of the king? The answer to both of these questions is no. So then why would we assume that we have the exact same authority, the all authority that was given to our heavenly king? So with these questions in mind, let's look at some common verses used to support the assumption that we have all authority because you can't come free of this type of demon, hidden demon, unless you know about your authority. So I'm just going to give a little bit here and then you can research the fullness of it in the class and you can even have free tutoring and and really uh, dive into this topic. Romans 8, 17. And if the children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So many people say we are joint heirs with Christ, and if we're joint heirs, we have exactly what he does, that we have the exact same authority Jesus does. But there is a second half to this verse. Okay, here's the second half to that verse. Same verse, Romans 8, 17. So it's it's like this. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, so that if we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together with him. 
This puts that statement in the proper context. Paul is talking about the enduring suffer that the, there were those enduring suffering because remember Christians were persecuted when Jesus left and that we can endure that that suffering because we are joint heirs with Jesus that will be glorified in heaven that we as Jesus rose from the grave and went to heaven so we too get to be in heaven you inherit something and you receive your inheritance when you die when someone dies Christians are, were giving their lives when they refused to deny Jesus Christ. So Paul was encouraging them about their future, that when they die, you will inherit salvation. This is not about having the same authority as Jesus. In order to walk in your full authority, such as it is with Jesus, the, the authority he has truly given us, we must be full-grown sons and daughters of God. It is listening to the Holy Spirit that brings us to maturity. This is Romans 8, 14, a, a few verses before this. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You see, we have to be listening to the Spirit of God and doing what the Spirit says, being led by Him. Then we are truly mature sons and daughters. And then we will have the authority that Jesus gives us. So a demon may become hidden if you abuse the authority and use the name or the blood without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I've seen this in prayer appointments when there was a hidden demon popping up and we asked why. Why was it popping up? And it and it had run when somebody used the name and the blood without the proper authority, without the proper authorization by Jesus. And it had hidden to make people think that it had gone. But it was really still there. So if we have abused the authority given us to, by our Lord, sometimes that spirit may appear to leave for a season then it will come right back in. So let's look at the next, the next place that may allow a demon to be hidden, come in and be hidden. John 5, 13 through 14, English Standard Version. Now the man who has been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may come upon you. After Jesus had healed the man who couldn't walk, the man testified, it says in, earlier in John, the same chapter in John, it says the man testified his, about his healing in the temple as Jesus instructed. But then we see that Jesus warned him against continuing in sin. If you have committed a sin which gives the demon acts to access to us if you are healed of that well then that demon may return a short time later and the affliction may be worse than it was when it began and sometimes the de these demons will remain hidden until you start making progress with god and then all of a sudden you'll get hit with these things from the sin that was committed once a demon is removed if it comes back, at this point, it will be necessary to identify the sin, confess, repent, and take care of it with the blood of Jesus to remove that, that demon a second time. So the very last one is the biggest category for a hidden demon. So let's go ahead and look at that now, today. If you have listened to a demon, then you have given it a place. According to Leviticus 20, uh, verse 6, this is the King James Version, it says, And the soul that turneth after such has have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go whoring after them. I will set my face against that soul, and I will cut him off from among his people.
As discussed previously when we were talking about levels of demonic attachment, there is a stiff penalty for associating with spirits who are not from God. It says that if you turn after, that means to do as they instruct, to listen to them. Well, then God turns his face from us. This means you will lose God's favor and his presence. It also says that you were cut off from among your people. Well, in those times, this was said to God's people in Israel, if you were cut off among your people, you could never, you could not go to the temple and offer sacrifices and offerings. This means that God will not remove attacks of the enemy. It means you have no way to go and plead your case before him to offer sacrifices, to be in contact with him. Some enemy spirits can appear in familiar forms to loved one, the form of a loved one. They will appear with information they have gained from watching that person their entire lives. Their goal is to get us to invite them into our lives and eventually to have a home within us. You can invite the Holy Spirit to come inside you. That happens at salvation. And the Holy Spirit will advise you and help you. Or you can invite a demon inside who will attempt to trick you and manipulate you. You see, we cannot have any um, fellowship, any connection with demonic spirits. This is, this is listening to them. We cannot use a Ouija board. We cannot be um, a part of a seance. We cannot watch somebody who's doing spirit writing. We can't chant magic spells. We can't operate in witchcraft or even consult spirit guides, tarot cards. None of those things are okay. All of them may involve demonic spirits whom the other people are listening to, the one who's controlling the seance, who's um, do the, doing the spirit writing, who's doing the tarot cards. These but they'll be listening to the demon fall who's been assigned to you. So we can't do that. We can't listen to these things. There are also ceremonies being practiced where family lines are being dedicated to, to demonic spirits whom they call gods. That's lowercase g. When animal or human blood is spilled, when a life is taken, it can create a curse that will be passed down that family line for all generations. This curse is often reinforced with seemingly harmless traditions and customs. So if you are in a part of the world where there's traditions and customs, you have to ask yourself why those exist. You see, these Traditions can be harmless. It can be chant this prayer of thanks and drink drink something or eat something. Say this prayer and bury uh, the umbilical cord of a baby to plant a tree and dedicate it to that person. It can be dance like this or wear special clothing. It can be a hundred thousand things. There are as many traditions as there are different tribes and peoples upon this earth. I've only encountered a handful of them that are linked to the worship of other gods, maybe a couple dozen at most. But the thing is, you have to ask yourself, how did this tradition begin? Was it a part of a ceremony to another god? We discovered this type of invitation, like I said, just months ago. Some things were consistent with those who are plagued by demons. Number one, the, per, the people often, the people involved, the people who had a demon issue, they often didn't even know that they were possessed or, or harassed or oppressed by a demon. They had a blockage, but they had no idea that there was a demon behind it. They thought they were just struggling with sin or they were just, you know, uh, they, were, they weren't sure why these things were happening. All of the people involved who had this hidden demon, they were, they had participated in traditions thinking that they were harmless. After the Holy Spirit brought the revelation about how the possession or oppression began and why the demons kept remaining despite the confession and the trying to turn from sin, the Holy Spirit brought the revelation of, of the tradition, of, of the background of the ancestors 
And so then they researched the tribe, the family tradition, and then the link to those gods was re was revealed. It was the ancestors who had worshipped gods by doing these things. Now, each person involved, all these people that we had prayed for, they had given a demon a place through their actions, often thinking they were listening to the Holy Spirit. Often they thought they were actions that they were doing, even worshiping God, but they were not. Some of these individuals, they were leaders of churches. They were teachers within churches, many churches. And yet all along, there was this demon that was directing and guiding them at some times. You see, traditions and customs may seem harmless, but they can give the enemy a place in our lives. When later generations become aware, they become Christians, they're not aware that those traditions are keeping that door open to this, the other, quote, gods, little g, those demons posing as gods. And then they struggle. They have a hard time getting rid of these spirits that are plaguing them. They can have a hard time worshiping God, reading the word of God. They can struggle in with pride, with anger, and they don't know why. But it's the generational roots of the ancestors' actions worshiping other gods through those traditions and customs. You know, even if we don't purposefully listen to a demon, I mean, many of us as Christians, I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't want to listen to a demon. If I knew it was a demon, I would run the other way, right? We will not run the other way because we don't run from demons, but we would rebuke it in the name of Jesus, right? We wouldn't have anything to do with a demon that we, if we knew it was a demon talking to us. But there are some sneaky tricks that the enemy can play on us. The sneaky tricks that he has played on me. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you here. This happened to me. Okay. So one time, one time, well, not more, I should say more than once, more than once, the enemy has come trying to pose as a member of the Trinity, whether it's Jesus, Holy Spirit, or even God himself. So you don't have to be born with a demon attached to you or possessed without knowing it and have a hidden demon for this type of thing to happen. But if you do have a hidden demon, it'll be much more common. So a demon once appeared to me in the guise of my most beloved friend, the Holy Spirit. If a demon can get us to believe that they are speaking as God or from God, then this imitation can lead us astray. So here for you today is an example from my life of what happened. So you'll so you'll know why so many Christians wind up in a ditch. You see, I had been experiencing correction from the Lord in the form of vertigo. Sometimes, sometimes when I used to walk in a wrong direction, the Lord would use vertigo to let me know I was doing wrong, right? And depending on the severity of the sin, I, the, the dizziness would be less or more. I'd get dizzy every time I stood up, every time I rolled over in bed, and, it, and it's horrible. At, at one point, I actually threw up because of it. So this, I went through this repetitive process for months, couldn't figure out where the open door was, kept confessing, repenting, I'd get free, and would come back. So I would spend time in prayer, the Holy Spirit would reveal something, I would confess for the sin, cover it with the blood of Jesus, and it, the Virgo would leave for a time, but only a couple of days. Then it would return again. This is a good indication that there is a demon hidden and it has a place that you need to find that root place to get rid of it. When it keeps, like I said, the hidden demon will pop up every now and then, right? So three weeks into this cycle, I lay down on the couch on my left side. And when the vertigo assaulted me and I cried out for the Holy Spirit, and I said, Holy Spirit, what is going on? Why is this happening? My eyes were closed. And a familiar form appeared to me. It was the full grown version of the Holy Spirit. And he was laying on his side facing me. He was so clear and so vivid. As we talked, something seemed a bit off. So I asked, do you confess that Jesus, the Christ, has come in the flesh and to the earth? 
the man laughed. Now, I've seen the Holy Spirit as a man and as a child size person. I'd never seen the man laugh. I'd seen the Holy Spirit as a child laughs all the time, but the man was pretty serious. And it seemed like a different sort of laugh somehow. It kind of, you know, something was kind of odd. About that time, I was momentarily distracted because my dog jumped on the couch with me. When I refocused, the man was completing what he was saying. I assumed it was he had said, yes, that Jesus did come in the flesh. So I continued talking to him. But then small little quiet voice reminded me I hadn't really heard his confession. So I said, again, I'm so sorry, but I must ask once more, do you confess that the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Christ, has come in the flesh to the earth? Immediately, the vision began to crumple like a wadded up sheet of paper with distortion lines running through it. And then it vanished. I cried out, Holy Spirit, what happened? A small, quiet voice filled with so much love said, that wasn't me. That love touched my heart so deeply, I knew it was God. It was his spirit. I said, why was it allowed to come when I called for you? My teacher replied, you gave it a place by listening to it. I cried out in panic, how? When? When did I give the spirit a place? My mind filled with memories of the last few dozen times I posted on Facebook of all things. Although I didn't feel like it was from God, I just felt this nudging to go and share it in different rooms, different, different groups. So I did it. Now I know that was a prodding by the fake Holy Spirit, causing me to get into self-effort. You see, it's not up to me to share in other people's groups. I share on my page. It's up to the readers to share it when they, if they want to. It's not up to me. This is an example of how a hidden demon can get a place in your life, how easy it is. It can be very subtle and seemingly innocent. Sometimes we just feel that something is hindering us and we can't put a finger on it, how or why. There's little things that keep popping up in our life. When, when events persist against, against us, it is often because we have stepped out of line, giving the enemy a place to us. And Satan loves to imitate God. So we must be careful when we have experiences in the spiritual realm or listening even to others who do. Let's look at this in the word of God. I want you to see how deceptive Satan can be. It says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. this is the English Standard Version, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan will try to imitate one of God's angels or even the source of light himself, who is Jesus. The Bible tells us not to fall for this, that we must test every vision we are to, to if we receive, if we're conversing with the spirit, even if they look like Jesus, even if they look like God or the Holy Spirit. So let's look at that. Here is John, 1 John, 1 John 4, verses 1 and 2 in the English Standard Version. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are, from, they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. I have tested visions with the Lord. When it is him... He is delighted with my determination to receive only from him. The enemy will try to distract me, get angry, or just disappear. If you are listening to teachings from someone who is claiming to see a vision of Jesus, make sure, make sure that they follow these guidelines. 
Number one, every revelation must line up with the word of God. The whole world, the whole word, not just one sentence. God will never contradict his word. Two, does the revelation line up with the heart of God, of who he is? You see, God is always the same. You'll find an example of him doing that in the word of God. Three, does the vision give glory to God? God should be primary in the vision. It should be something connected, deeply connected to him, giving him glory and not the person. And number four, do they test the visions, especially when it's a new concept, a new revelation? You see, anyone can be led astray. Anyone can be knocked down by the enemy. It is how you respond to these setbacks that is important. If you were born with a demon, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. If you were led astray and listened to a demon, it doesn't mean that you can't still reach the destiny the Lord has for you. We just but must be willing to listen to the Lord and get back in line with him. We began this message, message by looking at Ephesians 4, where God tells us not to be angry, right? And give the enemy a place. Let's put that in the full context of the chapter, because that is going to show us how to identify if we're listening to a demon, if we're plagued by a demon, if others are plagued by a demon, it will help us. So let I, I know it's a lot, but we are going to look at the whole chapter from beginning to end. And we're going to do it very quickly. I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis and point out a few things. So let's look at that today. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, 3 Amplified Classic Version. I, therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you and beg you not beg you to walk, lead a life worthy of the divine calling which you've been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons of God's service, living as becomes you with complete lowliness of mind, humility, and meekness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another, and making allowances because you love one another. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard to, and to keep the harmony, the oneness of and produced by the Holy Spirit in the binding power of peace. This list of traits contains many of the fruit of the Spirit that is listed in Galatians chapter 5. Here we see that it's humility, meekness, gentleness, patience, patience, and long-suffering. All these things are mentioned. You see, it? it agrees with the word of God. And if you are truly submitted to Jesus, if he is your Lord, you will begin to operate in the body of Christ, and these traits will be developing in you. Humility is the opposite of pride. Please see the free online class, Attacks from People to Learn More About Pride because that's a huge open door for hidden spirits. If you are drawn to those who operate opposite of these ways, they operate in pride. They, they have some traits that you will find in attacks from people and a, um, persistent attacks and sickness. If you, if you find you're drawn to people with traits that are enemy influences, then there may be a hidden spirit in your life. Let's continue on. Here is Ephesians 4 through 7, the Amplified Classic Version. We're going to go right, continue right on. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling you received. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, sovereign over all things, pervading all and living in all of us. Yet God's unmerited favor, his grace, was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of, of Christ's riches and bounteous gifts. We must always remember that it is God who gives us gifts that we need to work for him and that he's in charge. We cannot partially judge and criticize and condemn others because we must know that God gives us grace 
to do the job, that we are all overcoming different challenges and we're all at different stages in our walk. Ephesians 4, 10 through 8. This is the English Standard Version because we don't need the extra definition, so I'm going to try and make it shorter for you here today. Verses 8 through 10. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high and led a host of captives and he gave gifts to man and saying he ascended, what does that mean? But he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. We must always remember that Jesus conquered everything. He is able to set every captive free. It's, that is what he paid for so we can be free of the enemy. And he's given gifts to men so that we can help others get free. So what are these gifts? Let's continue in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we obtain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and de deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body is joined together, is held every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the purpose of the equipping of God, to help the body become free, to grow so they can do God's work, the work that God has assigned for them. We must be willing to speak the truth in love to one another. You, you see how many times in Ephesians it says to operate in love? It is the love of God that will build the body of Christ so it can function as it intends, but we must be willing to not only speak the truth, but to receive a truth in love. Here's Ephesians. We're going to go to the next part. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. We're back to the Amplified Classic version now. So this I say and so solemnly testify the name of the Lord and in his presence that you must no longer live as the heathen, the Gentiles do, in their perverseness, in their folly, in their vanity, in the emptiness of their souls, and the futility of their minds. Their moral understanding is darkened. Their reasoning is beclouded. They are alienated. They're estranged and self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge and, and perception, the willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to the hardness of their hearts, to the insensitiveness of their moral nature. In their spiritual apathy, they have become callous, past feeling, reckless, and they have abandoned themselves to an unbridled sensuality, eager and greedy to indulge, in every form of impurity that their depraved desires may suggest or demand. Those who don't really know Jesus, there are those who seem to be Christians, not just those who've never heard of him. There are those who seem to be Christians, but they're not willing to be part of the body. They are uh, puffed up in their own mind. They don't want to change their life. So their reasoning is darkened. They are insensitive to the moral standards that God expects of us. They're unwilling to turn from sin, to even have it revealed to them. They become offended when you talk about turning from sin. They are not submitted to their Lord. They are not truly his. Okay, now we can continue. Um, this is Ephesians. 
4, 20 through 25. But you did not so learn Christ. You did not learn this from Jesus, assuming that you have really heard and been taught by him. See, if you have not been taught by him, if you haven't received him, then you will, your heart will, your heart will be hardened and you won't think, uh, you'll think, oh, I don't need to turn from sin or this can't possibly apply to me. You'll be unwilling to examine your life and to turn to the truth. Assuming that you've really heard him and been taught by him as all truth is in Jesus, embodied and in, in personified in him. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off, discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterizes your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through the lusts and desires that spring from delusion. Be constantly renewed in your spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Put on the new nature, the regenerated self, created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, rejecting all falsity, being done with it. Let everyone express the truth with his neighbor, for we are all parts of one body and members to one another. You see, the fault may be a hidden spirit, but may also be an unwillingness to turn from past habits, past desires, past ways of believing, past traditions, past customs. Our spirit has to be renewed. And how is it renewed? By the word of God. Remember, the word of God is food. It's bread. We must be willing to read it, to learn from it, and to do it. We must put, a, put aside all those past customs, traditions, ways of doing it, sin, all that kind of stuff, and be willing to walk anew with God. Let's continue. Here is Ephesians 4, 26 through 29. When angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury or indignation last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. Let the thief steal no more, but rather let him be industri uh, industrious making an honest living with his own hands so that he may be able to give to those in need. Let no foul or polluting language or evil word nor unwholesome or unworthy talk ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech that is good, beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and the occasion, that it may be a blessing and give God's grace, his favor to those who hear it. Look at that. Here is a list of things we do not want to do. You see, when we realize, when we realize that Jesus has conquered everything, that he rules heaven and earth, that he really is in charge and has all power, our anger won't last because we know there's an enemy to our Lord trying to make us angry. We will trust in the Lord to take care of the situation. But we also have to be willing to stop sinning. To, you know, the, the stealing is an obvious sin, but all sin, if we know it's a sin, we should stop doing it and do what is right. Even our speech should change when we are a Christian. Do you still use foul language? Do you tear down instead of building up with love? Do you speak what is beneficial to others? If not, you may be plagued and troubled by a hidden demon that has a place because this behavior has continued for so long. Are, are you even willing to stop these things that are wrong? You have to first ask God to help you change. But if you are unable to stop, ask if there's a hidden demon and we are here to help. Let's continue. Because there is more. Ephesians 4, 30 through 31. This is the amplified classic version. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, you were marked, you were branded as God's own, secured for the day of redemption, for the final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. 
So you're delivered from the consequences of sin by the Holy Spirit, by the, his seal. You do not want to grieve him. You do not want to vex him or sadden him. And how, how does that happen? How do we grieve him? 31. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, and resentment, anger, animosity, and hurling, brawling, clamor, contention, and slander, evil speaking, abusive, or blasphemous language about others be banished from you with all malice, all spite, ill will, baseness of any kind. These are a great list of sins that will cause the Holy Spirit to be quieted. He will, when he's grieved, his voice will not be so loud. He will be quenched. Do you desire to seek more from, to hear more from God, to be led by him? Make sure that you check this list. If you're doing these things, even if it's only occasionally, his voice may grow dimmer. And if you're unable to stop doing them, perhaps it is a hidden spirit. Ephesians 4 concludes with this final verse. And become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily, freely, as God in Christ forgave you. God is gracious and merciful. He sent his son. He forgave us when we are still in sin. He forgives us when we sin because he knows we are not perfect. We must be willing to forgive others. You see, God, he is just there waiting for you to turn back to him, for, to forgive others, to be kind-hearted and tender, to stop and be willing to stop sin. If you are willing to change your ways and follow his ways, then he is here to help you. If you feel you cannot forgive, the Lord is here to help. Begin learning the ways of our God. Receive prayer when it is time. It is very presumptuous to assume that there's only one way for God to remove the enemy from our lives. But we are here to help you. We've only experienced some of God. It's not the limit of how God's moves. This is why if you come for help, there are classes to learn from. There are there, then there is prayer. Our intercession appointments we wait upon the Holy Spirit to instruct us of what needs to happen, what needs to be done when you come in for prayer. We must rely on our Lord to show us how to handle each situation, to lead us and guide us gently into the truth. But we are the body of Christ, and we are here to help each other. On the Living Word website, you can find a link to a church with the teachings to help you grow, to help you understand what is necessary, where there's a place for prayer, for questions, for help. That is the message the Lord has for me to bring to you today. Jesus has your answer. He is here to help you. And we're here to help you connect to him so he can help. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are your servants, Lord. Jesus, we call you Lord, owner and master. Teach us your ways. Lord, soften our hearts. Help us be, to be ready to learn. And if we see it in your word, if we see it supported by who you are, to do it. And reveal, Lord, any hidden spirits in the lives of those who are listening, who are willing to accept it, who want to be free. Expect that demon to pop up and show itself. And be ready to find the root cause. Because the blood, Jesus, your blood has paid the price to set them free. We thank you that you led the captives free and you're still leading them free today through your sacrifice. In your name, I pray these things. Amen.
until we see you again. Shalom.